two great talks. Um, uh, so we've got one lovely talk at the end to finish us off. Hopefully we'll all feel warm and fluffy afterwards. Um, because we're all designers and um, Andy's going to talk about designers at a better advantage. Um, so Andy, um, we all know, I don't really need to do much introduction, but CEO of Clear Left, um, user experience designer, many years, um, he's written books, organised conferences, and lots of talks, well, uh, digital festival, etc. etc. So um, I shall hand you over to Andy and his talk on design at a better advantage. Great. Thank you very much. It's really nice being back in, um, in Fabric actually. Um, the last time I spoke here was nine years ago, probably about this time of year, for the very first Deconstruct. So Deconstruct's been running nine years and this is the first time I've been back. We've moved from here to the Corn Exchange to the Dome, but it's kind of fun. When we were here before, none of the speakers had the nerve to come and stand up here and present. We were <laughs> down on the front, so I thought I'd kind of give it a go and um, here we go. This talk is basically, um, my response to going to lots of design or lots of conferences, lots of startup conferences, and getting really frustrated by the amount of focus that people have on technology and the tech culture and the lack of design being mentioned at some of these events, and so this is my sort of response to that. So when you're creating something new that's never existed before, in this case like this Death Star, and it solves a particularly annoying problem, the rebel scum in this case. Um, people tend not to care how well it's designed, they just want the problem to go away. And you see this lack of concern in a lot of early day products, like this commercial hairdryer, <laughs> like these electric curlers, and this device for curing Victorian ladies with hysteria. Uh, if any of you guys don't know what hysteria is, look it up on the internet, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's clear from all of these devices that the aesthetics and user experience and comfort of the people using these devices weren't really considered when they were created. They were first and foremost engineering problems. However, in the rush to market, most of these products can contain critical flaws, like the curler's tendency to set their customer's hair on fire. And if you're not careful, it's kind of game over. The problem is, despite all of these flaws, you always find a few early adopters. People who... Um, don't mind how like, ridiculous they look when they're using new products because they just really want that feature. They want the problem to go away. The, da the danger, obviously, is if we're all designing for these early adopters, um, you'll think that you've solved the problem really, really elegantly um, until these less forgiving users come along. And when the less forgiving users come along, they'll start to notice all the problems you have with your product. They'll notice it's ugly. They'll notice it's confusing. And generally, if you've ever tried to buy tickets on the Tokyo subway, they'll realise that it's really difficult to do. And as I said, it's game over. Because what will happen is a competitor will come along, who's younger, who's smarter, and they'll try and outdo you. Um, I put this slide in just for a bit of fun, a little kid on a, on a computer. Um, I spoke at a conference recently called The Next Web, gave this presentation. They had two CEOs of companies under the age of 13. Um, so it's actually true. If you're 22, 23, 25 in the audience, you're already over the hill. I'm sorry to tell you this. Because there are people out there who will be coding way past their bedtime to build products that are smaller than yours, that are more powerful than yours, or just are packed full of lots of useful features. Instantly, Internet Fridge. The only reason I can see the point of Internet Fridge is because compared to the cost of a fridge, a few thousand pounds, the cost of a screen and a Wi-Fi card is so small. We've got a device lab in, in our office in Brighton and we've got tablets that are like $20, $30. It's crazy. Um, it's kind of an, it kind of really reminds me of like the 80s when everything seemed to have a little blinking LED screen in it. Um, it's a classic case of design being driven by what's possible and what's technically possible rather than what's desirable. The danger of that is very, very quickly these things become a commodity. Um, what was really cool and sexy, like the internet fridge, now becomes just you know, something you get given away when you sign an insurance um, uh, you know, contract for a year. They must have to become commodities. And when this happens, you suddenly find you're not in the design market, you're not in the innovation market, you're basically in the manufacturing business. And as much as so many of the, the designers we've seen um, talked about today really want to be in physical products, manufacturing is not a sexy business to be in. It's a low margin business, it's not much fun. This is the point when most companies seem to start taking design seriously. They've had a product, it's, it, it's sold, but then it starts to kind of slow down, and they need to kind of make some kind of differentiation. And so, you've got competitive, um, competition from other companies, 
Um, you've got consumer demand kind of driving people wanting the new sexy um, kind of products. And also you've got general kind of design trends that are kind of going on in, in the background in the atmosphere. The thing that's interesting to me is what you're looking at now is uh, 100 years of, of generation of the three products that I talked about earlier. Um, the downside is uh, in digital products you're expected to have 100 years worth of innovation really in about three or four years. People don't want to wait so long for these products to be iterated. They need it really, really fast. Um, the other thing that interests me just randomly is it seems that any product aimed at women eventually will be gold-plated. I don't really understand that. Um, the other thing is this device also is a USB drive. I'm not really sure what you'd want uh, this device to have a USB drive for, but there you go. Anyway, if you don't know what this is, again, look it up on the internet. Um, so when most people think about design, obviously they start to think about the aesthetics. Um, and I do think aesthetics are important. A lot of UX people were kind of like, you know, we're beyond that. I think aesthetics actually can provide a lot more value than we think. Because um, you can use beauty and desire to kind of um, drive a uh, competitive advantage to kind of set yourself up from your competitors. Um, a classic example of this is um, Beats um, by Dr. Dre. You know, before Dr. Dre came into the market four or five years ago, it was a highly competitive market. There was no one sort of major player. Um, and Beats came in and basically said, we're going to own this market. We're going to own this market through design and through brand. And they created a whole range of products that are incredibly desirable, that are priced just right, um, despite the fact that most audiophiles would say they're really inferior to sound quality. And actually, if you get one of them, they're quite classic in engineering ones, then they're not a great product. But they've competed on design. And Beats by Dr. Dre now basically own the market, design, purely through design. However, as you know, aesthetics aren't the only thing. Um, you can only take aesthetics so far, as if any of you have tried to use uh, the start Juicy Silif Juicer, you can attest to it's a beautiful piece of engineering. It would look great um, on a product designer's kind of like um, portfolio, but it's actually not very nice to use. You get more juice down with your arms and on the counter than you do actually in the cup. Now, I see a lot of products, and a lot of products we design kind of looking like this. Um, they're products that are designed by super users, either us or quite often in startup world by the MD or the head of marketing. Um, while the solution might have all the features that you're looking for that a super user wants, basically most people feel intimidated by the level of complexity. What they're actually looking for is something like this. A really simple um, design that ditches away all the cons confusing unnecessary sort of embellishments and focuses on the core product. Um, and this will help you kind of cross the chasm into the sort of mainstream market to an audience who just wants something simple. Now, obviously, no matter how elegant these things are, um, you know, you can sit around the drawing board and discuss them until they get out into the hands of your users. You don't really know how people are going to behave. And so, obviously, getting some kind of obsessive level of understanding of your users is really important. Um, and obviously, we do this in our industry through usability and through research. Um, if you're still not sure what good design looks like, I think these around principles are a pretty good start. Um, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but obviously design is much more important than aesthetics alone. And actually, I think if you're looking for some kind of guidance, these are pretty good sort of direction. To me, I see good design as like a detective story. Um, you see the bad detectives, and they will, um, they will, they will kind of catch or try to catch the first sort of suspect that looks likely. And usually if you've watched anything like The Bridge or, or any of those kind of scandy dramas, you know that the first person that looks most likely isn't going to be the one. And the good designers are the ones that kind of build up a picture of the crime scene, sift all the evidence, stick it up on the wall and start to pot, spot patterns. Because after all, good design is basically about pattern matching. And I think, you know, this, this sort of um, builds into our lives. I think if you're a, a designer, your, your workspaces need to look like this. They basically look like they need to look like there's been a crime that's been cr uh, committed. And frankly, I think if your workspace doesn't look like this, then, uh, or if you're the designers you're working for's workspace doesn't look like this, I kind of start to question why. Because this is what good design looks like. It's messy, it's confusing, and it looks like a crime has happened. Obviously, we've got lots of tools at our disposal. Um, we've built all these kind of great tools. The Carno model is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Carno model, but the basic idea is you've got three kinds of um, sort of uh, lever that you can use in design. Uh, you've got the basic expectations. So for instance, if I'm staying in a hotel, I would basically expect there to be a bed there. If I go into a hotel room and there's a bed, I'm not going to get particularly excited. It's what I expect. If I go there and there's no bed, obviously it doesn't even function as a hotel. 
You can pour these basic expectations in, but you're only going to reach a certain level of satisfaction. The next one are the performance payouts, where the more you add, kind of there's a linear relationship. So for instance, I go to the hotel and they have a slightly bigger flat panel screen than the last hotel I stayed in, I'm going to like it slightly better. Not lots better, not massive amounts better, but just slightly better. And unfortunately, I think a lot of startups and a lot of products focus in this area here. There's a kind of a certain sense when you're doing design work that people are trying to buy features, they're trying to buy um, sort of bulk. And so you're constantly being asked to kind of add more features, add more features, and there's kind of this linear expectation that the more you put in, the more the clients are going to, or users are going to like. The thing I think that, that we're particularly good at as designers, and I think the thing that often gets forgotten, are these delighters. And this is a, this is a slide that I show in all of my sort of slides, but this idea of building things into products that are, that are cute, that are interesting, that are delightful somehow. The thing that I find interesting about this is there's very little chance you'll see this on a Kanban board. There's very little chance you'll see this in a, um, a, a spreadsheet given to you by a product manager. These are not the kind of things that appear in the agile design process. They're not the kind of things that appear in the lean design process. They're not the kind of things that get tested based on hypotheses. These are the kind of beautiful little delighters that I think we're all responsible for, that designers have to own. And if we don't own these things, if we didn't push back yet to product managers and the lean and agile enthusiasts, Actually, all of the delight gets slowly cut away from your product until all you have left is these kind of lean um, performance kind of uh, features, which is not good. There's a bunch of companies that I think are really good at delivering delight. I think MailChimp is a company that excels at delight. Um, it's a relatively boring product. It's, a, it's an email client um, for sending out mailing list um, details. But they have a lot of fun and they do a lot of playful things. And the people that, that use MailChimp absolutely love it. They've kind of got an emotional res resonance to the brand. And it's something that I think um, very few of us in this industry actually manage to do and do well. Another example is Zappos. If you've ever read anything about Zappos, amazing customer-focused company. Um, there's, there's no um, focus when you're on the phones about kind of getting off the phone as quickly as possible. I think the, the world record phone call was about a 12-hour long phone call. They've been known for Zappos customers. Zappos is a shoe company in America, by the way of their customers phoning them up and saying, look, I'm in Las Vegas, and now you guys are based in Las Vegas. Don't want to buy any shoes, but do you know any good like pizza joints? And their staff will actually say, yeah, sure, you know, go and check out Joe's on the strip. It's a really good pizza place. This is the kind of stuff that doesn't, like I say, get, get featured in a list of um, to-dos, but it's really important. Um, one of my kind of like obligatory Seth Godin kind of quotes, Seth Godin is a great um, sort of product person, and his kind of core philosophy is basically take all of your marketing spend, all the spend that you normally spend on advertising, and put it into your product, because <coughs> the product is your best marketing asset. And quite a lot of companies have done this. A classic example, I think, is um, Dropbox. Dropbox, when they started, they were paying between $233 and $388 per user for acquisition, so they do paper, paper clip marketing for a $100 product. So they're paying $388 for a $100 product. It doesn't take a genius to realize that this is not a good business strategy. And so what they did is they spent all of their marketing effort on building a really, really seamless product. And lo and behold, they're kind of the darlings of user experience at the moment. People love them because of this. They love them because of just the thought and care and attention that went into the product. So obviously what we're talking about here is designing products that people don't just have like a, a, a neutral reaction to, but the products that people love. And unless you're de designing developer tools like GitHub, really design has to be at the centre of this process. Because I think when you, you bring design into this process, um, you kind of get this sort of multiplying effect. You get beautiful products that are desirable, you get products that solve human problems, um, and develop a deep understanding of their users. And, and these things kind of merge together to create something that's delightful. And if you've seen today, Nestle just relaunched a new product, a smoke alarm. You know, who, who could imagine that you know, a year ago that a, a thermostat would be a, you know, a hot, sexy product? Now they're developing smoke alarm, it's amazing. But they've owned that market because of design. Particularly a market that's never had any design thinking before. Now if you study, you know, if you've done any MBAs in here, I don't know, um, one of the kind of the, the key sort of messages or one of the things you'll learn early on in an MBA is you need to try and create products that are easily defensible. And back in the day people did this with technology. People thought, well if we just hire the best developers and we get the, the you know, spend loads of money on great server software and stuff, then we can create a, a barrier around the product that's going to be really difficult to attack. That doesn't exist anymore when you've got sort of, you know, 
uh, EC2 and S3 and, and cloud computing and stuff. You can, you can develop really, really high-end products now incredibly quickly. Technology is no longer a barrier. It's no longer protection. But I think design is. I think design actually is really difficult to copy. And you see this happening around. You see lots of people who are first to market and then other latecomers come along and try and copy the tropes that are used. But you can tell the copies. They're never quite there. They never quite get it. There's never quite that level of quality. Actually, design is incredibly difficult to pull off and pull off well. Because good design really does take time. It takes effort and it takes money. And these are things that a lot of people don't have enough of. There's not enough talent out there. There's not enough time and consideration. And a lot of people have tried. You know, the Nokia's of the world and the mobile phones in the world have tried endlessly to create these beautiful products and often have failed. It's only just now that I think people are actually getting it. It's kind of a little bit too late. The irony is that companies like Nokia have actually poured loads of money into research and R&D. And I've spoken to plenty of Nokia designers um, that, have, that have bemoaned like, you know, things like Siri launching or, or other kind of new features in the iPhone and said, we actually designed that five years ago, but we couldn't get into the product. Our, our bosses wouldn't let us. So there's a real problem. There's, even though at the top there's a desire to innovate, there's some middle management, there's something happening that's, un, that's stopping design from manifesting itself into, into these products. And it's, it's a shame. Because what these companies need, really, is they need a great designer, they need senior designers. But unless you're a design-led company, you don't know what good design looks like. So I see time and time again startups going on to Dribbble to find some hot, talented designer you know, usually somebody in their kind of early 20s, often you know, um, not from the sort of local area, someone who's quite cheap, and then they tell them what they want the designers to do, and the designers go away and manifest what they think is in their client's head. Because that's what they think good designers, because these people are not designers, they're stylists. They're really good at mimicking the styles of other people, um, but they lack the initiative to solve the really tricky problems, or even to ask the really tricky questions. They spend their time trying to make their clients happy rather than to try and make their clients' clients happy. Initially, if you've not seen this guy, um, a fantastic guy from a company, uh, a TV show called Hair Battle Challenge. They do things like create the Eiffel Tower of hair. Um, and I think there's plenty of apps out there that for me are the Eiffel Tower of hair in design form. Apps that look beautiful but actually serve almost no function, that have got very little... Um, to do with real design, but are manifested and trumpeted as, as interesting designs are. Now, like I say, this talk comes out of a lot of frustration of talking to, to startups who have got a limited amount of budget. And so they're trying to be clever. They're going to go, well, because we've got a little amount of budget, we're going to try and hire the cheapest designers possible. They hire that cheap designer. Six months later, they haven't delivered something. They get a slightly more expensive designer. Six months later, they're still basically where they were. The runway is coming up, and by the time they actually twig that design is the problem, often they've run out of budget. They don't have enough time to actually to get to where they need to be. And so I think it's important for, for startups to start realising that good design takes time and costs money, and they need to hire the best designer they can as early as possible. And the good news is if you hire really good designers at the start, like most good designers don't want to be sticking around with a company for, for years and years and years. They want to kind of solve the tricky problems and move on. So you can afford to hire good designers at the start and then bring in the juniors and the stylists later on when the design styles have been set. But I think a good designer up front is worth their weight in gold. And I kind of think, you know, I think we're doing our clients a disservice if we don't kind of push for that. Um, so instead of hiring stylists, you know, our clients need to be hiring design thinkers. People that can challenge assumptions, people that can untangle messy design problems and get to the right solution as quickly as possible. These kind of designers add a huge amount of value to startups, um, not least because they can stop them wasting huge amounts of valuable time on dead ends. However, they're really difficult to find and they're costly. And so I think if, you know, if you're in the startup business, you need to try and move away from agencies and consultancies and freelancers, which is kind of a weird thing coming from a person that makes their living off of selling their, their design services but look into kind of um, hiring uh, design or finding design co-founders. And we've seen a bunch of really amazing uh, startups happening in the last kind of two, three years. Hugely successful startups like your Airbnbs and like your Kickstarters, a design co-founder sort of initiated. 
And it's also something I think that's interesting for the designers in the room as well. You know, it used to be the preserve of technologists that they'd be the ones that would be founding startups, or it used to be the, the, the preserve of the business people. But I do think now we're moving to the era where designers are the people that are driving the, 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 the car. I think they're the ones that are kind of have the value um, and have the kind of the uniqueness to kind of build great products. So if you guys are designers in the room and you're kind of feeling a little bit frustrated about where you can add value, then I think sort of looking to move into the product and spaces is definitely worth it. One of the big reasons I think why it's important to have design up front is because some of the biggest design problems are business problems. And if you're not tackling the problems that your clients have from a business perspective, then you're not doing good design. Too many companies bring on designers far too late in the process, where all of the big tricky problems have already been set. And quite often, they've been set in the wrong way. A lot of the stuff that we do at Clear Left is actually, you know, quite often it'd be really difficult to distinguish that it's design. You know, we sit in rooms, we draw pictures, we use things like business model canvas, which I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. But we might spend weeks and weeks and weeks working with a client before design is even kind of discussed. It's hard business stuff that, you know, maybe you know, consultancies like Accenture would typically be doing. But it's something that we all need to be doing. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with Lean. I think Lean is largely a good thing. Um, I think Lean has been teaching the business people and the developers what our designers have said that we've known all along, that we have to get out of the, the office, that we have to go and talk to users, that we have to iterate. Um, and I think there's lots of great programs if you are a developer and not a designer to go out there and, and, and brush up your skills. Um, but one of the downsides I find with a kind of lot of Lean thinking is it's kind of fixation and almost fetishization on analytics. I go to lots of conferences, business conferences, developer conferences, and there's this belief that almost you can get away without having designers if you're just using analytics. Because obviously, rather than needing designers, you just throw up two versions of the design, and you know, lo and behold, A-B testing will tell you which one's the most successful. Of course, that's not true. That's never been true. Um, I think um, uh, following the analytics and solely the analytics is kind of like trying to drive a car only by looking at the sat nav and never looking out the window. Eventually what's going to happen is you can come down to a roadblock, as happened to this driver in, in Yorkshire um, about six months ago. Totally following his, his sat nav, wasn't looking where he was going, completely stuck, what an idiot. But I see this happening time and time again with startups. They're kind of ignoring the lessons that the industry already knows in favour of quick fixes. And you get stuck in, in, in kind of local maxima if you do this. Um, the other benefit of having co-founders, I think, are designers is you can build this culture of design. I mean, one of the things that is really important about any startup or any agency even is trying to create a, a, con a community and a culture where people feel welcome, feel wanted. And as I said, I've been to so many um, tech conferences where they have the CTO explaining how they've designed this perfect environment for developers to collaborate, where they have all these, you know, if you talk to Jason Fried, he'll tell about how, like, you know, the design, you're not allowed to talk to the developers during the day because it breaks their concentration and everyone's sitting in separate rooms kind of like coding away, like sort of, you know, sort of um, organ grinders and, and monkeys. Um, but apparently, you know, a lot of, of you know, tech-focused agencies love this culture. Um, you know, you've got to build culture to actually get the best out of people and to hire the best staff. And I think we need to be focusing on creating the best design culture in our companies, in our startups, in our organisations, because it's hugely important. On saying that, design is really a team sport. It's not a solo job. And I think this is something us designers have got to figure out and understand. There's a certain level of protectionism amongst designers, that this is our little sandbox and we want to play here and you're not allowed to be involved. You tell me what you want me to achieve, and I will go away and do it, and I will present you this magical thing. And that's how design works. Design is hugely collaborative, and we need to get better at working with each other. Um, in the same way as everybody's responsibility is bugs, you know, it's not just the, 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 the role of the QA team, it's the role of everybody in the organisation, the same as design. Of course, the designers are the experts, they're the ones to guide, the ones to facilitate, but everyone needs to be involved, everyone needs to be sort of doing cross-functional pairing. Um, and, and frankly, you just need to hire the best people. This is the thing I find to sort of happen time and time again. The reason so many products fail, the reason so many companies fail, is they just can't hire good staff. And as I say, it's a great time to be a designer, I think, because you're massively in demand at the moment. Silicon Valley really is sort of waking up to the, the power of design. Um, only quite recently, really, in the last couple of years. In the last uh, couple of years, 18 months, I've had two <coughs> of my friends' companies being bought. Um, one by Facebook and one by Twitter. And they've been bought not 
for any IP, not for um, you know, any kind of cool technology that can be bought for the design teams. Because at the moment, in San Francisco at least, you cannot find good designers for love and the money. It used to be the case that you would value a business in San Francisco a million dollars per developer. So you've got a 14 person you know, agency, one to two million dollars was the valuation for an actual hire. It's coming to be the same now for design. People like Facebook and Twitter will pay designers two million dollars to buy the companies that they're in. It's quite impressive. Um, so design has value, it has real value. So basically I just wanted to leave you guys with three things. Um, three things that kind of startups and agencies and businesses and your clients need to consider. They need to realise the value of design because design adds value to the business and it's something we all need to be explaining to our clients much better. Um, we need to build a culture of design that really understands that it's on par with business, on par with technology. And we need to hire the best designers we can afford. Um, so yeah, that was what I wanted to say. Thank you.